Hello, Car Church. Here we are again uh, in the Word and with the with the, our time in our wonderful sanctuary here, and so thankful to be with you again tonight. Uh, we just returned actually uh, this last week when this is being broadcast. Particularly, we just returned from being in Phoenix, Arizona, and very busy but very fruitful and wonderful time there. And uh, what was uh, always fun for me and interesting for me is to uh, have people come up to me and uh, say, hey, I'm really enjoying Car Church. And I'm thinking, wow, that's so fantastic that you're watching Car Church all the way out here in Phoenix, Arizona, or wherever it might be. So wherever you're watching from, we are really thrilled for you to be here and always uh, cherish this time together. So Patty's here with me. She's going to greet us and pray. If you got your Bible with you, get it out and turn to Luke chapter 17. And our topic tonight is an indestructible kingdom. And I think this is going to be a very strong and very revealing word for us tonight. So here's Patty. Hi. Glad y'all are with us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We're just so grateful for all that you do for us and through us, Lord. We thank you for Mike tonight, and we ask your anointing on him, your strength and your wisdom as he brings the word to us. And we give you all the praise for all that you're going to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, honey. So tonight we're looking at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, and we're reading what, you know, would be for most of us a very familiar verse of Scripture. But, you know, I have to say in, in all the 45 years I've been doing this, um, it's often the most uh, well-known verses of Scripture that contain a wonderful, profound truth that we've become so familiar with it that we, we just read right past it and we miss the depth of what's really there. Or the other thing that can happen is we're reading and we're reading through the old paradigm, uh, which we often talk about, about Christ, me living my life for Christ, rather than me learning how to let Christ live his life through me. And as a result, we read it through that old paradigm and we see it maybe as just a, a call to our human efforts and labor, a call to human religious striving or self-righteousness. Or, or somehow we miss the beauty of what's there. But praise God, we don't have to do that. We can read it through the lens of the of the paradigm of the great mystery that's been revealed to us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and, and we can find rich, rich truth here. So here we're going to look at this, and we're, we're calling this message tonight an indestructible kingdom. And Lord knows the, the kingdoms of this world are becoming more and more unpredictable, more and more fragile, more and more, uh, you know, untrustworthy, and and how deeply uh, we're committed to the kingdoms of this world can have a lot to do with how uh, fragile and uh, and unpredictable our own lives become. But again, we're going to discover about an indestructible kingdom. So let's begin here very quickly, verse twenty of of Luke seventeen. It says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees, when would the kingdom of God, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. This is such a profound verse of scripture. And I want us to look at some of the things that, that if we'll take the time to pause and consider, give us extraordinary insights into the nature of the kingdom of God and how it is distinguishable and how it differs from the kingdoms of this world. First of all, I want you to notice the question that the Pharisees were asking. The Pharisees were asking when the kingdom of God would come. I think that's a natural tendency for all of us. We tend to want to know when God is going to do something. When is God going to move? When is God going to accomplish his purpose? When is God going to show up? And that's exactly what the Pharisees were asking. They were asking, when will the kingdom of God come? Well, why? Because for the Pharisees, their thinking was that the kingdom of God was going to come in a sense of natural 
rule in terms of physical rule, temporal rule. They were looking for Jesus to come and overthrow Rome to establish uh, Israel uh, as a mighty military might to come on a white horse with a sword to overthrow Rome and to establish Israel as the chief among the nations. So they want to know when's this going to happen. We're ready. We're we're all geared up for this. But Jesus begins to tell them not when the kingdom of God would come, but he begins to point to something completely different than that. What he points to is where the kingdom of God would come and what the kingdom of God is. Now those are very different questions to get answered. And maybe in your mind, you're thinking the same thing. You're thinking, when is God going to establish his kingdom? When is God going to show up and change the world? When is God going to do the work that we want him to do to make things better and change the circumstances of life? But if we're looking for, at, for the answer to the question, when, and we miss the answer to the question, where the kingdom of God will come and what the kingdom of God actually is, then we are really asking the wrong question. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. The question you're asking, you would never know when the kingdom of God had come if you don't know where the kingdom of God is going to come and what the kingdom of God is. Now, they were again looking for natural rule, physical rule, temporal rule on the earth uh, through the nation of Israel and at that time overthrowing Rome. But he begins to speak about overthrowing something entirely different because he came to overthrow something different. Because if he had overthrown Rome in an external temporal kingdom and established Israel geographically, but he had not overcome and overthrown sin and self and Satan, then he would have won no victory whatsoever that would have had any lasting meaning. But Christ did not come for that purpose. He came for a much deeper purpose. So Christ begins to answer by explaining where and what his kingdom was going to be. Now notice what he says when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. He answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. In other words, he says the kingdom of God is not a visible kingdom. It's not a traceable kingdom. He says, nor will people say, see, it's over here or it's over there. It's not a visible kingdom. It's not a traceable kingdom because it's not a geographical kingdom. And it's not an external kingdom. I, I don't know that there's ever a time in Christianity that we haven't needed to understand this more than we do right now at this time in the Western world, in the really in the entire world right now, where kingdoms are clashing with kingdoms and nations with nations and ethnicities with ethnicities, and people are trying to obtain power, cling to power, get in power, uh, withhold power, uh, all kinds of different levels of that, like three-dimensional chess, all of the moves are going on and counter moves, and all of these things are happening. But they're all focused on the natural, physical, temporal world. And many are, are, are operating in those realms in the hopes that they'll see uh, the kingdom of God get established and the rule of Christ be established. But again, if we ask the question when, but don't answer the question where and what the kingdom of God is, we're never going to know whether it came or didn't, whether it's coming or not coming. So he says the kingdom of God does not come with observation, so it's not visible. It's, it, nor will people say, see here or see there. It's not traceable. It's not geographic, and it's not external. So what is the kingdom of God? Well, here's what he tells us. Indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, I'm about to give you a, a series of phrases that if you get a chance to write these down or later on to listen to this on YouTube or to listen to it on Facebook again and pause, write these words down. Don't focus on it maybe as much now as hearing it with your spirit. But I'm going to tell you some things that are profoundly 
revealing about the kingdom of God simply by this one idea that the kingdom of God is within you. First of all, what is a kingdom? Well, a kingdom is made up of two words. One is the word dominion, and the other is the word king. And when you put the word king with the word dominion, you get the concept of a kingdom. So a kingdom is where a king rules and has dominion, has authority, has control. That's what a kingdom is. Well, the kingdom of God, he tells us, is not external. It's something completely different than that. And let's look at some of these phrases. First of all, here's what I want you to know. The kingdom of God is not a place. It's a person. What do I mean? The dominion of the king is not something that's about a geographical place. It's about the rule of a person. Secondly, the kingdom of God is not a realm in which I live. It's a rule to which I yield. So the kingdom of God is a rule to which I yield myself to. And what is that rule to which I yield? And who is that person, not the place, but the person that the kingdom of God represents? Well, obviously, it's Christ himself. It's Christ in us, not only the hope of glory, but Christ in us, the dynamic, the power, the animating force, the resource, the authority, and the ability to, to live out the calling to which we've been called by the power of his own life. So the kingdom of God is not a realm in which I live. The kingdom of God is a rule to which I yield. Thirdly, the kingdom of God is not a context in which I conduct my life. The kingdom of God is a connection through which Christ expresses his life. Because what is the kingdom? It's the dominion of the king. It's the rule of the king. It's the will of the king. It's the life of the king. It's the plan of the king. It's the purpose of the king. It's the, it's the very dominion of the king being expressed. That's what the kingdom is. And where is that happening? Well, it's not a context in which I live my life for Christ. It's a connection through which Christ expresses his life. Fourthly, I wrote this, the kingdom of God is not general, but it is intensely and intimately personal. The kingdom of God is within you. It's not within an institution. It's not within a building. It's not within a political party. It's not within a nation. The kingdom of God, if it is ruling, if it is operating in its dominion and in its authority and power, it's doing that in the heart, in the spirit of those who have yielded to the dominion of the king, allowing him to have complete access and control to express his will, plan, and purpose by the dynamic of his own life. Then I wrote these words, the kingdom of God is not something I am in, it's something one who is in me. So the kingdom of God, yes, it is the rule, but what is the proof of the rule? It's the king. I wrote these words, a castle without a king is just a big empty house. And it's the same thing. A kingdom without a king is nothing. A kingdom has no meaning divorced from, apart from, separate from the king. So if we're looking at the kingdom of God, we're looking at a castle that has a king, a kingdom that has a king, and it's the king who is the key to the kingdom. So consider these things. The kingdom of God is within us. That means it's not visible, not traceable, not geographical, not external. Rather, it is spiritual, internal, immeasurable, and eternal. It's not a place but a person, not a realm in which we live, but a rule to which we yield. It's not a context in which we conduct our lives, even for Christ. Rather, it's a connection through which Christ expresses his life. The kingdom of God is not general, but intensely personal. It's not 
just out there in the church somewhere. It's in you and in me. That's where he's wanting to express his life and his rule. And it's not something that I'm in. It's someone who's in me. Now, think about this. What a difference does it make, a powerful difference, if I know when the kingdom of God is coming, if God were to give me that information, but I didn't understand where, what, how, and why he was coming. If I knew the kingdom of God is coming tomorrow, but I'm looking for it in the external, in the temporal, in the geographical, then I'm, I'm missing the entire point. But once I understand that, that the kingdom of God is internal, eternal, spiritual, that it's a kingdom of the rule of Christ in the heart and the spirit of man, then I begin to realize that the kingdom of God has already come in the hearts of those who have yielded to him and is continually coming every day in the heart of those who are yielding daily to him. This word to come is the Greek word erhomai. It means to appear, to come into being, to arise, to show itself, to find place or influence or to be established. Now, if I'm looking for the kingdom of God to appear, to come into being, to arise, to show itself, to find place or influence or to be established in the external temporal world, then I am looking for something and not seeing it. And the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. I'm looking for the kingdom of God to come. And it's not coming as far as I can see in the places I'm looking. And my heart starts to get dried up because my hope is not being fulfilled. But the Bible says, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Well, if I turn my attention from the external to the internal, from the natural to the spiritual, if I change my perspective and my focus, then I start to say, the kingdom of God is going to appear. The kingdom of God is going to come into being. The kingdom of God is going to arise. The kingdom of God is going to show itself. The kingdom of God is going to find place and influence and be established in me. And every person that I can turn to the hope of Christ, turn to the salvation of his redemption, get to understand the invitation to become a partaker of his very life, the kingdom of God will come in them as well. It will arise and appear and come into a being and show itself and find place and influence and be established in their heart. And this is what the kingdom of God is always and was always meant to be. Well, how does that work itself out in our life? Well, we talk about this in so many different directions and so many different ways, but I don't ever want you to lose this key foundational paradigm shift of understanding that this is all about Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's about letting Christ have his way through us. It's about yielding, surrendering, relinquishing control, and turning over our lives to him. That's why Paul the Apostle, after he explains all of this and talks about it and, and makes clear and reveals all this, he, he then says, uh, what shall we say then to all these things, you know? And he, and he begins to talk about the idea of yielding ourselves presenting our members to him as living sacrifices, turning our members, our, our eyes, our mind, our hands, our feet, our, our resources, our ingenuity, our cleverness, our training, all of that, turning it over to him and yielding our members to him as, as sacrifices unto the Lord. Presenting our bodies, Paul talks about as living sacrifices in the Lord, which is our reasonable service or our logical response to knowing that the rule of Christ is inside of us. Now, there's two other verses of Scripture to glance out real quick. One is found in Romans 14, 17, 
where it tells us a little bit about the nature of the kingdom of God. And notice what he says here. Now that we understand where, what, how, and why the kingdom of God is going to come, then we can start to look at when, and we'll start to see the kingdom of God working all the time, all around us. Here's what he says in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. What what is eating and drinking? It's external receiving of something. Rather, he says, the kingdom of God is, by implication, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what's he telling us there? He's telling us that the kingdom of God, again, is not external. It's not about the things that we touch and taste and those kinds of things, but it's about something going on inside of us. The proof that the kingdom of God is come, the proof that the kingdom of God is appearing, coming into being, arising, showing itself, finding place and influence and being established, is where there is righteousness, where there is peace, and where there is joy in the human heart. That's proof that the dominion of the king is having its, its proper place, and that Christ is living, reigning, ruling, expressing, revealing, and manifesting his life through us. And peace and joy are the natural results of that. Uh, and, and a joy that's unspeakable, full of glory, a peace that passes human understanding, the Bible talks about. This is coming from the life of Christ being expressed, manifested, revealed through us. So that, as it says again in Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, that the treasure that's within us, the power of that treasure is of God and not of us. That's proof that the king is in power. The king is ruling. The king is in control. Then there's one other verse of Scripture along these same lines. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20. Again, he's going to tell us something the kingdom of God is not, but also reveal to us what the kingdom of God is. He says in, in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 4, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. In other words, the kingdom of God is not just talking about what we should be doing for the Lord. The kingdom of not, God is not just talking about an understanding right from wrong. The kingdom of God is not just talking about and becoming an expert in the analysis and in the understanding of truth and, and error. We can have all of that, but still the king is not in dominion. The king is not ruling The king is not expressing his life through us. And consequently, we're talking a lot, but we're not changing at all. As I often say, it's a theology of information, but not a theology of transformation. Now, we need the information. All of that's critical and important. And and nobody can ever uh, imagine for a moment that I don't do anything but venerate, cherish, treasure the Word of God at all times, because that's how we find out the life that God is calling us to. But if Christ is not in us, living through us, empowering us, expressing His life, enabling, and not only uh, showing us what to do, but to will and to do according to his good pleasure, he at work in us, if that's not happening, then all this information that we've gleaned and gathered over the years is producing nothing of this life. But if the king is on his throne, his dominion is established in us, we're allowing him to appear, to come into being, to arise, to show himself, to have place and influence and be established in our spirit to reveal and express his life through us, then the word of God and the kingdom of God become more than just words. They become power. And I'm telling you, this is not something I read about in a book. It's the difference I've seen in my own life between me trying to produce this life based on talking about it and learning about it and me learning how to let Christ express and reveal this life through me by me yielding, surrendering, getting out of his way, and acknowledging my incapacity apart from him, 
and welcoming him to take control. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. And this is what the kingdom of God is meant to be. So I can tell you some good news. If you've been waiting for the kingdom of God to come, hoping for the kingdom of God to come, looking for the kingdom of God to come, but you just happen to be looking, hoping, uh, searching in the wrong place, good news. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is coming every day yes ultimately in the final end the king will rule upon the earth again and Christ will sit upon the throne of the nations a new heaven and new earth will be established but the good news is we don't have to wait till then to live in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is within you The king is in you and me. And the king is there not to watch us try and run his kingdom for him. Even if we do it with good intentions. No, the king is there to take his throne, to rule, to reign, to reveal, to manifest, and to express his life through us. This is the kingdom of God to which we're called. And what a glorious invitation. Why would we wait a moment longer to yield to the sovereignty and the majesty of this king? Why would we for a moment try and look for it in the temporal passing away emptiness of this world? It's in our hearts. That's where the king rules. And when my heart and your heart and your neighbor's heart and your children's hearts and your friend's hearts and everyone you can reach, when our hearts are under his rule, it will show up in the world. It will bring about change. It will shift the balance of human power. But trust me, it won't do it until it has first done it in us. And that's where we need to be building the kingdom, living, yielding to, and allowing the kingdom of God to be expressed in us. Amen? So let's go to prayer tonight, and what a joy to be with you always. A lot of rich stuff, a lot of rich stuff to go back here and chew on and meditate on. That's how you really grow in the Word. It's one thing to hear it, But don't let it just sit on your heart and not take root. Give it a chance to go deeper. Take the time this week to listen and make some notes and consider. Talk to the Lord about it. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm so thankful that your kingdom is within us. That means we have been given an indestructible kingdom. They can destroy us, but they can't destroy your kingdom. And they can't get us out of our out, out of that kingdom because once we're in it, we're in it forever. Your kingdom is in us, and then we'll be in your kingdom in, in glory and in the wonders of heaven. So, Father, we thank you that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Yes, that's true that one day the nations will bow their knee and, and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. But when I read that verse, the kingdoms of this world, will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, I also think about the kingdom of every human heart. The the multitudes of kingdoms, human kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me every day to help somebody take one step closer to that kingdom to, to allowing Christ to come into their heart by faith, but then, most importantly, to allow Christ to rule in their heart by faith. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints, what a joy. What a joy to be part in a, in a, in a fluctuating, cataclysmic, unpredictable cacophony of confusion that this world throws at us every day. What a joy to be in an indestructible kingdom. And guess where it is? It's right smack dab in the middle of you. Rule 
King Jesus over us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless. We love you all. Cherish you. Treasure every moment we get to be with you. And we pray for you all of the time. We just say, uh, we'll see you next week, the Lord willing, back here in Car Church. Amen. Good night.